We have an interesting subject this morning, exploring inner space. We hear so much about outer space. Everybody's talking about it, and I imagine our minds are becoming quite tired with space business and traveling in space and so forth. But in this traveling of inner space, it's a different proposition because in inner space, we really know our destination. But in outer space, the stuff I read and don't understand, I don't know if anybody knows the destination. It's quite ambiguous, I'm sure. But this inner space traveling is something that is exact and absolute. And so I want you to try and be interested this morning to get just a simple understanding of inner space. Now, this uh, definition or what I say about inner space is not absolutely scientific because uh, I don't know enough about space to tell you that, but I do know something about traveling inwardly in the search of the goal which lies hidden within us. First, I'll give you a definition of space so as to show you or give you an idea of what this space business is. The definition of space which I have taken from the dictionary is this, space, that which is characterized by extension in all directions, boundlessness. Space is boundlessness, yet it is not infinite. Realize that. That in which all physical things are ordered. So you can just... Think about space, the sun and the moon, the planets move in an ordered way. Space is boundlessness. And yet, Einstein's theory, if you follow that, if a ray of light starts at a point traveling as it does 186,000 miles per second, in 500 billion years, that's all, It will come back to the place from which it started. That will give you an idea of space. But that idea is not concrete enough for us, for our little brains, so to speak. But this which I will give you now is something I'm sure that you can remember. Outer space is what? Outer space is the receptacle of phenomena. The sun and the moon and the planets and each one of us, and houses, and ships, and automobiles, are all things of phenomena. And the receptacle of those things is outer space. Now, inner space is what? Inner space is the receptacle of not phenomena, but of noumena. The noumena of inner space, the underlying cause of things. Behind our sun is the great spiritual sun from which our sun borrows its light. And so realize that inner space is the receptacle of the cause of things. Our bodies are here before us in outer space. In inner space, so to speak, is the cause of those bodies. The thought form from God's great consciousness and that thought form projecting the great forces of the universe produce the spiritual part of us, the astral part of us. That's the noumena of this outer phenomenal body. So you see there's a direct difference, contrast between outer space and inner space, and I put it in a simple way that you can remember it. Outer space is the receptacle of phenomena. Inner space is the receptacle of the reality of noumena or the cause of things. And so, where is our soul, so to speak? Our astral body is in inner space. It's in inward toward the cause of this physical body. Our souls are in inner space. Inner space, the cause of outward things. Realize that and you'll have no trouble in understanding the few things which I tell you this morning. Now, inner space cannot be known through the senses, mind, or intellect. Can you think of knowing your soul now that you have practiced perhaps a little meditation 
through the senses, mind, and intellect. You cannot see the soul. You cannot reason it even. But if you project yourself in inner space, when the thoughts have gone to rest, and you've risen above senses, mind, or intellect, there you will find the soul easily through the intuition of its own power. Through love and affection, we can know even the pinnacle of power and consciousness of inner space, which is the holy mountain of God, the city of Zion spoken of in the Bible, the sun of righteousness upon the summit of that holy mountain. That's the epitome of inner space, the power and consciousness of inner space. And so, by intuitional realization, we can know about inner space. To know about an atom, you become the atom itself. To know about God and inner space and his power in that inner space, you become God himself. Because we are one with him, but we feel apart from him. We can remove that idea of separation then we can realize ourselves as one with him in inner space. Now the appearance of truth is phenomena. The appearance of truth. You see me and I see you. That's not truth. That's the appearance of truth. The truth is the underlying noumena which causes your body and causes the expression of your soul through your body and all that pertains to you. That's the noumena of inner space. That's the reality. Seemingly reality is phenomenal, but truth is of the noumenal region. Reality. And so, as Max used to say, things are not as they seem. They're quite different. The reality is the cause, the underlying noumena, and that is not found in outer space. In the phenomenal world, it is found in inner space, in the noumenal world. Now, Master has said this, we, being children of omnipresence, might be likened to the chick of omnipresence, imprisoned in the bodily cage, which pecks through intuition at the shell of finiteness. You know how the chicken pecks. Finally gets out, but he pecks at the right place. And that right place is what? The spiritual eye within us, the door to infinite space. Realize that little illustration about the chick in the shell, the chick of omnipresence. That's us. We are omnipresent. We have the omniscience of God. And we're encaged in this finite cage corresponding to the shell of the egg. And through intuition, we begin to peck. Not through mind or senses nor intellect, but through the intuition of the soul, and we peck at the right place at the spiritual eye of which Jesus said, the door to infinite space. And so you can see that infinite space is very much related to our freedom, freedom from being encased in this worldly consciousness of this body. And we will peck our way, so to speak, through the spiritual eye until, as Larry de Marcia says, penetrating the little star in the center of the spiritual eye which those who meditate can see, we enter the realm of the infinite. We know inner space. Now, the goal, the goal of inner space is, as I have said, the holy mountain of God. The supreme consciousness of God, which is in each and every one of us because we're little miniature universes, made just like the great universe, the epitome of which is the spiritual son of righteousness. And that is within us. That is within us in the supreme center of the brain. The kingdom of God is with men. The kingdom of God is with men. In inner space, that great power of spiritual power and consciousness of God is love is right within us. And that's what we are searching for. That's the goal of life. Now, when you take ordinary travel, when you travel in an ordinary way, there are many different paths which lead to a common destination. 
And as you travel, you may have pleasures and see different scenes, and sometimes you'll have hardships. And so it is with the traveling in a space. We are traveling to a common destination, and that common destination is the presence of God in us. The holy mountain of God, right within us, in the supreme center of the brain, because in that holy mountain, on its summit, is the sun of righteousness, the presence of God, completely and fully. And so there are many paths leading to, say, the base of that mountain, paths of good works, church associations, and devotion. But if we are to reach the summit of that holy mountain, there is one common universal path which must be followed, the path of self-realization, along the royal highway of the spine to the supreme center in the brain. Everybody must pass through that highway. Along that highway, when we approach near and to the holy mountain of God which is within us, we must travel on the same universal highway. Traveling that universal highway brings to all people the universality of religion because it cannot be traveled unless you know the word of God within the holy vibration, the cosmic sound of Om, spoken of in St. John. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. That is the presence of God within us. Having that, we travel the one common highway to the summit of the holy mountain, the sun of righteousness, the supreme presence of God within each and every one of us. Not something far off, something attainable, something knowable. Now I have a reference which says just what I have spoken to you about the holy mountain of God. Imagine it right in our own Bible in the 48th Psalm. Great is the Lord. That's Christ consciousness or cosmic consciousness within us. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our Lord, our God, in the mountain of his holiness. Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth, earth means body here, is Mount Zion. On the sides of the north, the city of the great king. Sides of the north, this is the north of the body, this is the east, as I have explained several times. The west is the posterior part. And so, in the north part of the body, or in the supreme center of the brain, in the thousand petal lotus, is the holy mountain, spoken of right in our own scripture. And, as it says, beautiful for situation. The, the sight of the supreme center of the brain is very beautiful. And joy, the joy or bliss of God fills the devotee when through the grace of God he perceives it. God is known in her palaces for a refuge. So God is not far off in inner space. He is right within us. But he's knowable only through the vehicle, travel vehicle, so to speak, of inner space, the intuition of your own soul, not through senses, mind, nor intellect. And so, to find God, all devotees, regardless of church affiliation, race or creed, must go within, must travel inwardly in inner space to find the presence of God. All must go that way. It cannot be known unless you go within. And the way or the method of inward space travel, so to speak, is meditation, that's all. Meditation is the vehicle. Meditation means what? Concentration on God. Not through senses, mind, or intellect, or reason, but through the intuition of your own soul. And that comes by meditation. Meditation, so to speak, is the spaceship to travel in a space. Realize that. And right meditation means not only introspection. Introspection is the negative approach, so to speak. In introspection, you sit calmly and you look within, so to speak, and evaluate what you have done, say the last day or the last week or the last year 
or the last life even. But that's a negative approach to exploring inner space. The positive approach is to do something positive, to do pranayama. Yama means control of prana or scientific meditation. That's the inner space boat of travel, so to speak. That is what we must do. Introspection is all right, but it's negative. The positive, the positive way to travel in inner space is through scientific meditation. Scientific meditation. And that is made up especially of Patanjali Yoga, of which I have spoken many times, with its eightfold steps. I'll come to that in a minute, speaking about introspection. That's sort of a, a negative approach, as I have said. And the negative approach brings to my mind a little story of this minister's son. He was a very naughty little boy. And he did lots of things he shouldn't be doing. And so, to punish him, they wouldn't let him eat at the family table. They set a little table on one side. He sat there. And so when he sat down, his food was brought to him. Little fellow saw him, he said, he said, Lord, I thank thee. Thou preparest a table in the presence of mine enemy. <laughs> so that's a negative approach, isn't it? So introspection is the negative approach. The positive thing is to do something definite and positive toward finding God, not just to think about it. Introspection is necessary but it must be followed by that positive thing. And so, as we follow this positive state of exploring inner space, as we do that, then we will attain the presence of God. Attaining the presence of God, then we can merge along this, by following this common highway in the supreme center or the holy mountain of God, in which is or in which resides the Son of Righteousness. That's the positive aspect. That's what we must do. And so, about the, I was going to speak about the eight steps of Patanjali Yoga just just for a moment or two. First, we have the Nayama, Nama, and Nayama. The do's and the don'ts. That's all. You must live a, a good life. You must not steal, and things like that. We all know those moral conditions. Those constitute the first two steps. The second is asana, posture. If you meditate, you cannot be slumped over. As I pointed out this morning, we must sit in the right posture. Very important. Very important are these postures, so that the spine be open, that we may travel the royal highway to the summit of the holy mountain or the presence of God's consciousness within us. Those are the first three. The next one is pranayama. Pranayama. Very important. Every technique of self-realization fellowship is an exercise of pranayama, control of life force, pranayama. And the greatest of that pranayama is kriya yoga. Kriya yoga is the fastest accelerator known to man to take him to the summit of the holy mountain within and to allow him to merge through God's grace in his holy presence. Next comes prachahara, which means interiorization. As you meditate, you know your consciousness is withdrawn from outward things and goes inward toward the spine and toward the holy mountain. That's called interiorization, or prachahara is the Sanskrit word. Then the last three steps are very important. You cannot follow those last three steps unless you have got interiorization. In other words, you cannot concentrate. Narana is the next step. You cannot concentrate unless you're interiorized. With your attention outward, can you concentrate inside and, and explore inner space? No. Then the seventh is Nayama, which means meditation. And the final one is Samadhi. So there you have the eight steps taken. A Patanjali Yoga as you travel in inner space. I have a reference from a master which I might give you at this time, which is very apropos. And as I have said, as you travel in a space, you will know you're in the presence of God. You will know, so to speak, you are at the base of that holy mountain of God's presence 
when you hear the cosmic sound of Om. Understand that. And that means when you hear the cosmic sound of Om, or when you see the light at the Christ center, or when greatest of all, you feel the bliss of God, you're in his presence. You have explored inner space to the extent that you are the, at the base of the epitome of your exploration, the holy mountain of God. You will know that by the cosmic sound which you feel and hear. Realize that in your meditation when you hear that cosmic sound, see the cosmic light at this point, feel the love of God, you're in his presence. You have gone a long ways, but you must not stop there. But it is the presence of God. Patanjali says this wonderful thing. Patanjali speaks of God as the actual cosmic sound of Om. That is heard in meditation. Om is the creative word, the whir of the vibratory motor, the witness of divine presence. Even the beginner in yoga soon inwardly hears the wondrous sound of Om. Through this blissful spiritual encouragement, the devotee becomes convinced that he is in communion with divine realm. So, realize exploring inner space means we know where we're going. Millions of people do not know where they're going. They're taken up with this exploration and that in outward living, making money and all sorts of things. But the devotee of God knows where he is going. He is going back home to his cosmic home of light from whence he has come. He is going back to God. He knows he's on the way because he hears the cosmic sound of Om. That is what he follows. That's the pole star because that is God. Patanjali says, Om, or the Vedas say, he who knows Om knows God. Realize these important truths of inner space and they are easily attainable. If you will follow one who had explored inner space and found God as our beloved master, he has given us the techniques and the wherewithal to do likewise. Now, one point I'd like to bring in just in a brief way, but I think it is necessary, is this idea or this point of restlessness that is within each one of us. Restlessness is the greatest deterrent to the exploration of inner space and the attainment of God. Why? Because breath ties the soul to the body. And if your breath is restless and your inner workings are restless, so to speak, you cannot concentrate and explore inner space. It's a very important point. In the autobiography, I will not read it all to you, but just point out to you that on page 248, there are many illustrations given there as to the mathematical relationship between the vibratory rate within you and full realization of God, the, vi the respiratory rate, I should say, and the states of consciousness within us. Very important. When there's anger, lust, and anger, and lust, and such things within us, what happens to the vibratory rate of your respiration? It soars. And remember, breath ties the soul to the body. How can you explore inner space and find God with restlessness of breath within? It's a very important point to understand that. Now, when you are concentrating on something, some problem, deep concentration, or performing some physical task which requires full attention and delicacy in handling, handling it, what happens to your respiration? It slows way down flows way down. And so when you are concentrating on God fully and performing the greatest thing that you can in delicacy, so to speak, your breath will slow way down because breath ties you to the body and you cannot get out of this body while the breath is operating. It's a very important point. That's why the techniques of self-realization, especially those which control the life force and control the respiratory rate, are very important the highest technique of concentration. You see, there's a science between it 
which I would like to give to you. And so, this respiratory rate is very important. You know the monkey, he's always jittering around, jumping around. His respiratory rate is 30 some, 32 I believe. Ours is 18. Why? Because he's jittery. He's always doing monkey shines and so forth. I suppose that's why it's called that. And yet on the other hand, the elephant and the tortoise and such animals, they breathe with a very slow respiratory rate. The human is 18, as you know. And so, uh, for instance, the elephant, the tortoise, and the snake, they live a long time, but their respiration is very slow. Uh, for instance, the uh, respiration of the tortoise. He lives to the age of 300 years. I don't know as I'd like to live that long, but he does. And his respiration is four times a minute. And so, breath ties us to the body. Realize that. And so when you perform the techniques of Kriya Yoga and the other pranayamas, you'll find your respiration slows right down. Why? Because you are exploring inner space and you cannot reach the pinnacle of inner space, the royal, the holy mountain of God, until you have released the attachment of the soul to the body. It's very important, very scientific. And as your breath slows down, know, know that you are traveling the right road in inner space and you are nearing the presence of God, which you long for so much. And so, in the autobiography, untying the cord of breath, which binds the soul to the body, Kriya Yoga serves to prolong life and enlarge the consciousness to infinity. If you travel inner space, one-pointedly toward God, your consciousness will expand to infinity and to the presence of God as your own self. Such is the power of Kriya Yoga and the different techniques of self-realization fellowship. Now, going on just a bit, and then we'll be finished. It takes... A million years, not too long a time, considering I just was talking about 500 billion years or something. It takes a million years to travel in a space and reach the goal. In other words, it takes a million years to rise above ego consciousness, that's all. It is a consciousness of ego that separates us from the presence of God. It takes a million years of ordinary living and pretty good living, healthy living, to break the attachment of the soul to the body as ego. And yet, through the practice of pranayama, and especially Kriya Yoga, that can be done even in three years, but not ordinarily. But it can, without too much difficulty, be done in one lifetime. And you can reach the goal of the summit of the holy mountain, the sun of righteousness, in one lifetime with not too much difficulty if you follow the scientific way of meditation. Many devotees, even sincere devotees, are following the inner path, but they are not following it with the right method. That's why it takes so long. And that's why we should consider ourselves fortunate to have this right method attested to by our Master's presence here on earth with us and his great teachings which he has left for us to carry on and to do. And so, as we travel in a space, instead of taking a million years to be freed from this bodily vehicle, we can do it in one lifetime. And so it is something to look forward to. As we practice our pranayama, and go within, there comes the state of divine certainty. That's the greatest thing. In this outward living, traveling in outer space, so to speak, there's no certainty. Look about you. How do you feel? How do the peoples of the world feel? No certainty whatsoever. But as you travel in a space and push on toward the goal of oneness with God, there's a divine inner certainty comes which no one can shake. Why? because the practice 
of right meditation bathes the cells of the yogi's brain or the true devotee's brain with the spiritual elixir of God's great presence. That's what changes our brain. It takes a million years to change the brain cells so that they will record the consciousness of God. But as that spiritual power of God flows through the yogi's brain or the devotee's brain, those cells are changed so that they can perceive the consciousness of the holy mountain in which God's consciousness dwells. These are scientific facts which are little known, but that what is what happens to those who meditate regularly and really want God, not just think about him, really want him, and really want to explore inner space. And so the fastest way to travel is inner space and reach the goal of life is through the practice of Kriya Yoga, Pranayama, the fastest known route of spiritual progress. It is so fast that in the Bhagavad Gita we have it spoken of distinctly, which I'll give you at this time, and then I will close. Referring to yoga's sure and methodical efficacy, Lord Krishna praises the technological yogi, in the following words. The yogi, or one who explores inner space by using the right method of Kriya Yoga, as given to us by our master, the yogi is greater than body discipline in ascetics, greater even than those who follow the path of wisdom, or the path of action, Kama Yoga, be thou, therefore, O Arjuna, a yogi. Explore in a space by the right method, and you will attain the goal, which is the realization of God's consciousness on the holy mountain, the kingdom of God, the house of God, the city four square, as they speak of, right within ourselves.